Ryan Stanton here with AESEP Frontline, joined today by Dr. John Rogers here at the Tennessee AESEP uh, Annual Assembly or the Annual Scientific Assembly 2019 here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And we're going to be, this is part of our rhinovirus uh, series, uh, the annual little cold and allergies for me. So if it uh, sounds like I've got uh, pillows shoved up my nose, then theoretically that could happen. So um, Dr. Rogers is here. He's speaking about metrics. And that's a huge thing I know that we're dealing with. Of course, he's always been very active in the advocacy and um, and outside aspects uh, of medicine as well as a, a practicing emergency physician. But um, being being somebody who's who's looked at the, the metrics, the things that we are held to, how they're used, how they're abused, and I think we all understand some of the ways of which they're abused, but also some of the benefits as well. So, Dr. Rogers, thanks for joining us. All right, so let's get into it. Give us a little background on this talk, um, on the metrics, and and what you are seeing from from a standpoint, could you you just finished the talk down here, um, so this is this is fresh on your mind. You can maybe hear the background of the folks still on break um, after your talk. How is give give us roll us into this talk and, and what what it means to you? So it really has to do with the fact that the management by metrics is is leading us astray, and it and it goes back a long long time, um, even back to to Vietnam. With that being said, you know, we have to have some measurables in medicine. We have to have some way that we can compare each other. We've seen the, the issues with the patient satisfaction. We've seen the issues, um, the pluses and minuses. We've seen it with these metrics as well. We have to be able to measure. But what's the challenge in emergency medicine when we put a specific time stamp on the care that we provide? So it goes back to the concept that um, measures are a tool but they should not become the goal. They should not become the target. Because once they do, they cease being a good measure. Measures should help to inform, to make better decisions, but they are, they are not in themselves the goal. Mm-hmm. Because once you do that, then you lose sight of the big picture. And I think that's what's happened. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the biggest one for me right now, the metrics-wise, that, that I think has a potential for harm because of the way that it's measured is, of course, the sepsis. And, of course, we're now being pushed farther and farther with that, with trying to get this, you know, the recommendation for the one-hour bundle as opposed to where we are now. I even had a, I had a sepsis patient last week that had a history of heart failure and, uh, but had an elevated lactate that was over the range that triggers that supposed 30 cc's per kilogram ideal body weight bolus. Uh, but as somebody with heart failure and tenuous respiratory status. And so, you know, I went back and forth with the ICU, uh, with the intensivist about, you know, this. And, you know, of course, not to mention the number of false positive blood cultures that are coming, that we're having to call back to the emergency department because it's triggered, you know, the COPD or walks in from the, uh, walks in from the parking garage and, and meets all the sepsis criteria. So talk to us about some of these criteria that you see. Um, first, let's talk about some of them that, that you feel really are benefiting and advancing the care that we provide and the practices we work in. It's not a really good sign when you have to think so hard about it. That's, that says a lot right there. Well, so uh, let me back up there. Yeah. So if you just take um, quality measures and performance measures as a whole, I think we're getting um, off track, particularly when we start applying pay for performance. Because then that really pushes us into some perverse behaviors because it looks as though we're chasing chasing money. Mm-hmm. And and I think a lot of that we're being pushed into doing some of this from, from the facility side. Regardless, when people have studied pay for performance, it doesn't help. It doesn't help at all. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it just, it just uh, demoralizes the, uh, the working uh, uh, staff because... It assumes that, that we're swayed more by financial interests than intrinsic motivation, which for a professional, in a way, is, is kind of insulting. And I, th- I think when we start going down that path, when we associate these measures uh, with pay for performance, we're, we're really missing the boat. And a lot of these quality measures, they have not been validated. Well, do you feel, how much of it do you feel is almost like Prescani, where it's somebody without the training and knowledge in our profession trying to establish, you know, an understandable, measurable, deliverable to something that really is more of an art than it is just a checklist cookbook? Yeah, so 
this goes back to the foundations of what's called scientific management, but then mm-hmm. also, to me, the big lesson from the Vietnam War. So scientific management, founded in 1911 or so by uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor, Frederick Winslow Taylor. And he was working in the pig iron factory and wanted to make it work better. So and think about this as how it may apply to the emergency department. So what he did was he, he broke every, the process down into component parts. He looked at ways to make each movement, each action more efficient. He then standardized those actions and then pushed people to speed up and then made mandates that they did, set production goals, and would reward those that met those production goals and penalize those that didn't. And it all fell under the overview of a general manager, one who did not necessarily have the previous experience working in the pig iron industry or knew nothing about it. It was the concept of the general manager one who could manage by the metrics alone. And to then apply that from a simple system that was predictable, that was routine, whose workers had little intrinsic motivation or reward, to apply that to an ED, which is very complex, which is not simple, which is not predictable, which you don't do routine, repetitive work, is is not only just an assumption, it's, a, it's, it's not just a leap of faith, I think it's a prayer. And I don't think it has worked well. Um, so what you were saying, you know, it, 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 it resonated with me. It's someone else without the experience, without the knowledge, trying to apply something and manage something from afar by the numbers. Yeah, trying to quantify something that really has no defined quantifiable. So to me, okay, it's an attempt to digitize mm-hmm. the analog interaction between a doctor and a patient, and I think is failing. No, absolutely. I think. How much of that do you think is the fact that in so many environments that we're in now, it is not physician leadership within the hospitals and the C-suites, and you know we got more people that are you know ed- education management based uh, backgrounds, um, other uh, health professional backgrounds. But this generalized absence of the physician leaders in many hospitals now. Absolutely. I mean, it's all the uh, performance engineers, Mm -hmm. right, who come out with a degree in performance engineering. They know nothing about the particular industry that they're working in, but they're there to just manage the metrics. That's that's what it's about. Well, it's it's almost trying to simplify to the point that, um, just like you were talking about um, with industry in a factory, trying to simplify it to the point that, you know, if it were able to be simplified to that point, a machine could do it. A machine could do our job. And that's what we know is we know that it doesn't. I mean, every single day with the advancements in the technology we have, we know that we benefit from having uh, support uh, from, from modern technology. But at the same time, there is so much of an art and interaction and cultural differences and regional differences I mean, just walking into the room, and if you have two different patients with the exact same thing, they will present differently, they will describe it differently, and the whole experience will be different. And that's the thing about being a physician is not necessarily that, um, not necessarily just going in and checking boxes as much as it is painting a picture based on the supplies and utilities and brushes and, and colors that you're given, which can be extremely difficult. Right. It's an, it's an attempt to uh, replace um, uh, years of experience and, and judgment uh, with some mechanical, digital kind of uh, thought process. And, and make no mistake, this is not only about medicine. It's not only about emergency medicine. This thought, mm-hmm. this management by metrics has permeated our entire culture. It exists almost in every industry and in every profession to its detriment. Well, and the challenge, though, is that in medicine, you, you literally have lives in your hands, uh, lives in your hands. And so... You know, work working towards that. Are we really? And I'm. I see it all the time um, that we are willing to potentially put a patient or a situation at more risk just because of these things that are held above us. And we don't get emails and texts and communications from admins saying, "Hey, 
this patient, you did a great job. You, you really thought outside the box. You're very creative. It's always the emails are, you fell out of this metric. Correct. No matter the outcome, no matter the, the end result. Which is what I was getting at. It, it's, it's that you focus on the measure. The measure becomes the goal rather than the, the big picture. The other thing that's missing from this, so, so the reason all of this came into existence is related to that value equation, right? Value mm-hmm. equals quality over cost. But what's missing is the cost component. What is the cost of all of this reporting? And you have to figure that in. Um, Institute of Medicine says it costs about $190 billion a year for facilities to comply and about $5 billion a year or so for providers, which is almost $40,000 per physician to, to report. My question is, is it worth it? And so as many people know, my wife is the quality director for the hospital at which I work, which creates some interesting discussions sometimes. But so I asked her, because I see her doing this all the time. She'll be working on leapfrog reports. She'll be working on a report for this. She'll be pulling numbers for this, numbers. And I said, what would you be doing if you didn't have to do all of that? She looked at me and she goes, I'd be doing my job, mm-hmm. which is to go down into the individual departments where we know there's a problem and help them work through it and actually improve the quality of care in this particular facility with the problems that we know and we have recognized. So there's an opportunity cost that we've lost, not, as, not in addition to just the expense of going through all of this reporting. What are some of the, you know, we've, with... ASEP with with CEDAR in terms of reporting, trying to target more to more realistic uh, values and, and benchmarks and, and outcomes, uh, as opposed to a lot of times what's given to the, the, our profession in emergency medicine as well as throughout medicine. You know, it's just as something here it is. We as this nondescript group, governmental agency or whatever, feel like we're going to, you know, this needs to be tracked for some reason or the other. Um, where, where, where do we go? I mean, we know there's going to be metrics. We know there's going to be stuff. How do we, so, how do yeah, we move through yeah, this? So, so a lot of it, I think, is, number one, that measurement in, in and of itself is not bad. It mm-hmm. depends on how it's interpreted and how it's used and how it's applied. It should be used to, to inform, to help make better decisions. Going back to that value equation, quality over cost. Quality, to me, is outcomes. And it, sh- it can't be process outcomes. It really needs to be patient outcomes. And too often, I think we're looking at process outcomes, mm-hmm. not patient outcomes. And there's some assumptions that are, have been made about all of these process outcomes. And I, and I think we really need to get back to patient outcomes and really focus all of our measures on patient outcomes. The challenge is there is that a patient outcome isn't always what the public may think, which is a, a healthy person back to normal, back to full health. I mean, we're all on a one-way street. And so when it comes to an outcome, say with stage four cancer, um, or outcomes, the, the outcomes are going to be different. You know, it's not just going to be getting them completely back to normal. I mean, I think right. that's one of our issues in this country is we try so hard um, to add more days, quantity of life versus quality of life, that we we feel like the people are going to live forever, and we know that that's not the case. And so even the outcomes may be more of compassion and um, comfort and, you know, the quality of days as opposed to necessarily quantity. So I think those are the those are the challenges because we, as physicians, we know what the best, you know, in most cases, know what the best outcome for this patient is going to be, and it's not necessarily going to be getting back to full health. Um, but I could even see that of saying let's do outcomes of – of seeing almost like what we see now um, with the nursing homes. You know, they've got somebody who's DNR, who's dying. They're going to shuttle them to the ER. They call EMS, shuttle them to the ER because they're not going to die in their building because they know that if they have so many, they're going to get investigated. So a couple of things. Uh, for one, you almost sounded like Einstein there who basically said, you know, all things that count cannot necessarily be counted. Mm-hmm. And I firmly believe that, um, that there are a lot of things that uh, are a little more meaningful and, and, and subtle. But, but the, the other is that in order to meet metrics, you, you, there's often all these perverse behaviors that occur. You know, let me just take an example, the, the, um, the 30-day readmit thing, mm-hmm. right? So what happens fundamentally, though, to a patient? Because the reaction to it is a workaround. Mm-hmm. You 
you put them in observation or you keep them in the ED. But the assumption is that, well, something happened, you didn't take care of them correctly initially when you sent them home, something. There was some fault on the provider that uh, at discharge. Mm-hmm. Um, when the truth of it is, well, it may have more to do with outside factors. So mm-hmm. Could they get to a PCP? Could they get their prescriptions? Were there other cultural uh, factors involved? And all of that, or patient compliance. Right. And a, a lot of that is just completely overlooked. But in order for us to make the numbers look right, we jump through hoops we put labels on them that keep them from being technically a 30-day admit. But the fundamentally, fundamentally what we do to patients is the same no matter what label we put on it. So it's a fraud in a sense. Well, and, okay, so what are the two most common? And I'm sure it's similar for where, you, where you guys uh, in Georgia as they are for me in Kentucky. The two most common diagnoses that we're going to see back that are going to fail that, quote, 30-day readmit are going to be COPD and CHF. Correct. I mean, I think those are hands down, respiratory-related issues. Then exactly what you're talking about, whether it's the ability to get your medicine, the compliance with the medications, compliance with a diet, compliance with oxygen therapy, um, compliance with uh, a primary care or a specialist. Honestly, it's the gaps. You know, it's those care gaps. We're so siloed in healthcare, and we have been for uh, decades now, that it's hard to do that whole transition of care that the patient care continuum as opposed to the way it is now, which is we're siloed as opposed to honestly siloing around the patient and figuring out how that whole linear aspect works. And I think that's been a huge boon for the um, community paramedicine environment. We've got one and they do a fantastic job because they meet those gaps. They figure out where those gaps are and help that patient bridge those gaps to where they don't end up back in the hospital. But again, measuring, saying that somebody comes back in 30 days, you failed. Well, no, it doesn't mean I've failed. It just means they have a chronic, in most cases, they have a chronic condition. Now, true, if they come back in thir- within 30 days with a some sort of hospital-acquired infection or something like that, that's a different story. But when you're talking about chronic medical conditions, just no matter how long they're in the hospital, it's not going to make that go away. Right. So is it, is it you failed? Or, or is it there's a there's a deeper problem that needs yeah. to be addressed? It's, it's, I don't, you know, I don't think it's that anybody failed. I think it's just we have complex patients. We are living longer. We have more chronic medical conditions. You know, we're going to have 25 percent of our population in the next 40 within the next 40 years is going to be over age 65. So you know, we're going to see more frequent, more complex medical issues that we're we're dealing with over and over. Another metric, uh, ED length of stay, and this mm-hmm. kind of plays out in the United Kingdom. Sandy Schneider is the first one that talked to me about it. This was a few years ago. But so there's a law over there that they can't stay in the ED longer than four hours. So what do they do? Well, first thing they do is they keep EMS outside the department until they're ready for them. Okay. So their, num- so their time doesn't begin to start. And the second thing they do is once they get close to that four-hour mark, they technically put them in observation. But fundamentally, have you really changed anything? No, the numbers look right. It satisfies the politicians. But you really haven't done anything substantially different, which to me is a fraud. And have you seen that with um, U.S. emergency departments, a lot of the competition, these 15-minute guarantees that you're going to be seen, and basically talking to them like, how in the world do you do that? There's no way your department's getting turnover in 15 minutes. Like, oh, no, we just send somebody in, they say hello, they click the time, and they go on. So really, it's, it's, it's exactly what you mentioned. It's all a workaround and really just, you know, putting lipstick on a pig. And again, it goes back to the fact that the measure has become the target. The measure is not informative anymore. It's not telling you, you know, it's not giving you information about how to look at things more broadly and what you might need to address or change here and there. They're they're used for performance measures, and people are penalized and punished according to them. So with that being said, Dr. John Rogers here, and I know you work really hard on this stuff, um, and it sounds like you work within your own home on this type of stuff as well is that where do we go? How do we break from these concrete shoes and move on to something that is actually has value to us and the patients? Yeah, so uh, there are a couple of things. Now, first of all, um, Don Berwick, old uh, CMS uh, director, I've not agreed with him on a lot of things, but on this I do. It's five or six years ago he wrote a paper about the um, psychic costs of uh, pay for performance, and he basically said, all of these measures are, are just way too excessive. They're being applied uh, incorrectly. We need to have a moratorium on them. 
and you need to abandon pay for performance. The other thing that I found interesting is recently the uh, informatics people uh, have come out and said that you need to abandon the use of the electronic record for billing purposes, administrative purposes, and reporting purposes, which intrigued me because I thought, how would that change the way I document? And I think it would change it significantly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I do think we also need to get some um, handle on what the effects are, particularly for emergency medicine, because uh, we don't know. All of this has been implemented without consideration, uh, considering the cost, the consequences, or whether or not any of this is effective. And I, I really call on, on our researchers, our policy researchers, researchers to, to, to start looking at metrics, how they're used, how they're abused, and, and how they really should be used, because I think we're really going down the wrong path. So we need our, our wizards out there in the research world to start putting this stuff together and figure out you know, how you, how you set forward. I mean, we, we're obviously in a world that, that demands numbers and measurables and data points. And unfortunately, healthcare is one of those areas where having a defined data point is incredibly difficult. And sometimes it comes at the detriment of the system and the detriment of our patients trying to reach that. And you mentioned the EMR, you know, with, with us having scribes, you know, they, they push them for every chart to be a five. Right. And so, you know, there's 10% or 20% of my charge, you know, cases, I'm going through the chart and pulling stuff out saying, this is not germane to this case. This is not there. I don't want this. And they're like, well, it may not be a five. I said, well, this patient isn't a five. And I want it. I want my chart to reflect what I did and what our patients did and, and everything that happened and not just go for that number at the end to be green and have a, and, and have a five on the back end. You know, you, you go in there and you do a, check on a little superficial laceration on the pinky finger and all of a sudden, um, you know, we're at, you know, we got folks asking if we need to document a genitourinary exam. I was like, not if, not if you don't want to get sued for some sort of inappropriate activities because it's, you know, this is a limited exam. This is a limited visit. It's, it's quick in, it's quick out. Let's do what the patient needs and, and take care of it and, and move from there as opposed to um, where we are now. And I, and I think the EMR right now is not a, at least the ones I have worked with, and I've worked with four so far, is they are not tools to help evaluate the patient and manage the patient. They are tools for tracking, billing, and administrative. So, so think about it. If you believe in metrics, if you believe in management by metrics, you have to have a steady stream of data. Mm -hmm. Your electronic record is that data resource, and, you, and the physicians have become the data entry clerks. Mm -hmm. And I see, you know, where I see the value in some of that data is looking for an outlier and something that's, yeah. that's different. So I've got one physician that somehow writes, let's just use opioids because that's what I speak about at these conferences. The, you know, opioids, somebody who's outside the bell curve for opioids. We can easily track that data. Or somebody who is not seeing patients within a decent time. You know, everybody's seeing them in 45, 30, 45 minutes, but we have one that's an hour and a half. You know, so you can look at that stuff and you can target and you can educate and you can train. You can kind of see where that is and use it as a constructive tool as opposed to what we are doing now, which is just basically hitting a bunch of check boxes like we're on our little analog machine waiting for it to spit out, spit out some sort of result. And it's just not happening. So a hammer. Yes. A hammer. Yeah. Is a hammer a tool or a weapon? It depends on, on how, how you use, use it. it, correct. And that's what I'm getting at with metrics. Yes, and absolutely, and that's exactly what we need. And, you know, the example I thought of earlier in listening to you describe it, you know, it's almost like we are trying, a metric version of medicine is trying to come up with an algorithm that would be able to paint every single picture with the subtle vari variations of styles, time periods, nationalities, artists, all of that stuff. And somehow in medicine, we're trying to say, you know what, with this one brush and these certain colors, we can paint every picture that ever was created. And there's so much more to it. This, it there's a reason why it's called the art and practice of medicine. And it's, it's because computers and algorithms and metrics cannot do it. And that's why we trust, I mean, it's one of very few things where you know, the longer a physician has been in, really, the more the better they are. You know, unlike sports where you got four or five years at the beginning and then you just start to tail off and get worse. Physicians with experience, you've seen it, you've experienced it, you know those variations. 
you know, in medical school and residency, we learn the books and the, the typical presentation, but as an attending, what you learn is the nuance, and you learn, you learn how to trust that little, the hairs on the back of your neck that just tell you it's just not right, and that's that art of medicine, and a metric can't capture that. Never, no. So how can folks get in touch with you if they want more information, have more questions, because uh, you're definitely much more onto this as, than I am, and... Uh, um, be interesting to see how we how we move forward. Um, a lot of efforts within the college and medicine, but I think a lot of it's going to take um, national organizations as well as physician leadership within our hospitals to really start to pull this around. And not only that, but physician leadership within our legislators as well. Best way is John Rogers, MD at BellSouth.net. There you go. As for me, you can contact me at youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, at Everyday Med on Twitter, and of course, our ASAP Frontline Facebook page. Uh, join us there. We post everything, all our episodes, as they're live on SoundCloud and on iTunes as well. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. Mm-hmm.